Ms. Zainab Iega is the Executive Director of C2 Year 2 Center for African Women and Families. It's a community-based social service organization based in the South Bronx. She manages the day-to-day -day functioning of the organization as well as guiding its strategic directions. Well, we look forward to hearing more about both of them and what they're doing and how this ties into our topic today. Welcome. Um, lucky draw, who wants to go first? Ms. Zena. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to thank Iman and the Drama Institute uh, for inviting for this wonderful panel. And I thank all the previous panelists for really giving us food for thought. And it seems there's a lot of work for us to do. I'm going to take a short time to share with you what I do in New York City. And then I'm going to share with you some examples because what I do is actually really uh, e examples of what really affects women. You know, so South Tier 2, which means our voice in Swahili, is a community-based organization that works with African immigrant women and their families in New York City, but also across the country. So when you talk about violence against women, what we actually see in our offices in the Bronx and Staten Island is actually the real experiences of victims who come to us day to day. We work five days a week and we have multiple programs. But let me focus on our most important program, which is our domestic violence and sexual assault program. And under that program, we provide crisis intervention, which means that we have an 800 number that women and girls can call. It's multilingual number. So it's in French and Arabic and English, but it's also in um, Wolof, Fulani, and Sonike. So, that's what we do. And secondly, when someone calls us, we do crisis management, but at the same time, we provide accompaniment, we provide interpretation to, you know, into the court system. We have legal representation so women can know what their options are and what they can do to get out of abusive uh, relationships. So before I go into detail, let me share with you a couple of examples of some of the cases that we see. One of our cases that we, we saw five years ago was a woman from Chad who had just joined her husband after being separated with her husband for 14 years. Uh, she joined her husband and found a husband who already had a second family in Brooklyn with four children. And she had been you know, married for all intents and purposes for 14 years while her husband had been having another family here in Brooklyn, she was in Chad. So when she came here to join the husband, of course, after 14 years, you're not the same people you knew each other with, you know. And quickly she became pregnant. And with the pregnancy became the assault, the battery. What brought her to us was one day when she was six months pregnant, the husband beat her so badly and threw her from a four-story stairs downstairs. She fell down. She was outside crying, bruised, bleeding, the bodega store that was beneath their building, storekeeper saw her, called 911. When 911 came, uh, they went to the build, to the apartment, and knocked the husband who spoke English, and she had, doesn't speak English at all. The husband told them his wife was crying because she had just come back from Chad. She was homesick. So the police left. The second time it happened, a couple of days later, he beat her again, and she was smart enough to immediately run out of the apartment, go to the storekeeper and say, can you call 911? The storekeeper called 911. The storekeeper was smart at that time and told her, the police, don't go and talk to the husband, take her to the shelter. So the police took her to the police station and they took her to a shelter. What happened to her was when she was at the shelter, because she couldn't speak English or any other language, she was in a shelter for three months, no one spoke to her because there was no interpretation. There was no language capacity. No one actually knew what she was going through. And it was actually by fluke chance that a friend of mine had another client in the shelter and the shelter director told her, we have this African woman here we don't know what the issue with her. We know domestic violence is involved, but because we don't have any language capacity, we've never been, been able to help her. 
So I got a call and I rushed to Queens in this family shelter. And I said, did you ask her if she spoke any other language other than her own language? Of course, they assumed she was from Chad and she spoke Gurani that no one could interpret. So from Chad, I'm from Sudan, let me try Arabic. And she spoke Arabic. And when I said, how are you in Arabic, she burst into tears and started crying and cried for two hours. The short end of the story is we transferred her from Queens to where we are in the Bronx and we helped her get a, you know, an apartment. We helped her file for legal representation. We helped her through her divorce. She got her papers. And today, she's the only person in New York who knows all the New York subways. And every time she calls me, she says, Zainab, who are you? She is speaking English. Yeah. Our second case is a young girl who was 14, an excellent student, an A student very bright and did her focus was math and science from guinea a beautiful girl but the parents thought she needed to get married the father sent her to the angolan embassy because the fiance that she'd been betrothed to lived in angola to go get a visa she didn't want to go she was 14. she told the school the school called us and we went we tried to talk to the parents they refused, they said this was their culture, and the girl wanted to leave. So what we did, we took her out of the home, and we put her in a safety. And we got the city involved, because she's a minor, and it's child abuse. But what the city did, because there are a lot of us Africans who work in city agencies, there were some of the Africans who worked in ACS who said, ah, she's become American, she's forgetting her African culture. And they sent her right back to the family. And before we know it, the family put her on a flight and there was nothing we can do. At 14, and this was a smart girl who, could have, who had the potential to do great things in her life if she was supported. Our third case that I wanted to share with you is a 16-year-old girl from Mali. Incredible, a beautiful poet and sings incredibly. And she's really beautiful in soul and body. But what none of us knew was that her father was sexually abusing her since she was nine. She never told anyone. But every day, she would come to our group, because we have a youth program, and especially for girls. She would come to the group program, she would participate, she would write poetry, she would write short stories, and she had a natural leadership because all the girls gravitated around her. She knew how to bring them together. She knew how to get them to talk. But she was always complaining about, you know, feeling, not feeling well. Her stomach hurt, her stomach hurt. And we took her to the doctors. They didn't find anything. We took her to a pediatrician. Because she was 16, only a pediatrician could see her. This went on for two years. And then one day, all of a sudden, at school, her social worker called us and said, you know, we took her to the hospital, and they found an infection. So we said, why? She's not sexually active. She's never said she, was, she had a boyfriend. All of the years we've known her, she doesn't have a boyfriend. She doesn't date. So how could she have an infection? Of course, there's a probability that she could have an infection naturally, because it, it does occur in women. But what turned out, the doctor said, this is an infection from external cause. It couldn't be from internal cause. So talking to her finally, she said, my father has been touching me for the last six years. And this is a guy, a father who prays five times a day, and he's a father who will come pick her up. And we were so proud because we said, he is an African man who cares for his daughter. We should give him the Father of the Year Award. Little did we know, you know, and so when he was asked, at that time he was back in Mali, going to marry a second wife, he was asked on the phone by his wife, and he said, oh, I wanted to make sure that she wasn't sexually active. That's why I was touching her to investigate. For six years. So anyway, that I can tell you about the case and how we dragged it on, that's a whole other story. Then the final story that I have to share with you guys, unfortunately, so I had a breaking story, was one of our young girls who was 13. 
a family friend who knew she was 13, who knew she'd never had sex before, sexually assaulted her. And he did it one day because after she came from school, she was the oldest and she would come home and wait for her father to drop her younger siblings at around 3, 3, 3.30, 4.30 because that's when the school let out. And this guy knew that she was at home by herself, but because, you know, the whole family usually say, anyone who is older, you call auntie, you call, you, you call uncle. So he said, this is, a, this is my uncle. So when he knocked on the door, she opened the door, he came in, and he said, oh, do you have something to eat? I'm hungry. So the girl said, well, we have rice in the fridge and some sauce, I can warm it for you. As she was going to the kitchen to warm up the food for him, he asked her, you know, have you been, have you had sex before? She had no idea what he was talking about. So he said, I don't know, teach her all up again. But you know, the, the horror of it, this story is that because the guy who assaulted her was the family friend, the father refused to press charges. And the mother told her, don't say anything. In fact, they went and have the whole community say she was the one who actually, you know, um, tested him, because he's a good Muslim man, hmm. tested him. So I've shared with you guys the various forms of violence our women and girls face when they come to this country. And it's not because there are not legal systems to protect them. It's not because there are no social services to protect them. And it's not because many of us who live in this country here don't know what is right to do. I think it's because we just assume that these forms of acts of violence are okay to take place. And finally, let me conclude by sharing with you an example of what happened. Last year, I was at a community meeting, and I happened to be seated by misfortune on a table with a group of men and community leaders. And do you know what the conversation was about? Apparently, there was a story in Zimbabwe that you know men who claimed they were sleeping and their women were raping them. So that was the conversation. That was the conversation at the table, and these men around the table were saying, look, our women have become sexually insatiable. They're raping us in the middle of the night. So I say, first of all, I take exception because I'm sitting at a table that I presume has men around the table who have integrity and a sense of honor, and you're talking about something that you don't know about, and it's in a newspaper in Zimbabwe that you are not even familiar with. Why don't you guys stand up and speak about the men who violate your daughters and your sisters and your mothers? Why don't you stand up and do that? And do you know I was asked to leave the table? Okay. So I just want to let you know that we have a lot of work to do. There are a lot of our women and girls who are suffering. We don't have time to begin to think about what we need to do. We need to do the work. What I need for my work in the Bronx is I need safe shelters and places where I can send the women and girls who want to get out of abusive relationships. And I've not even shared with you guys the most egregious forms of violence as yet. I need to form a team of women who can be interpreters and translators, who can accompany and advocate and support our women when they're in court, when they're at DA's office, when they are at the hospital. Because you know what? When she is in front of the court, do you know she's the only woman who's standing there and there are 10 men with her husband who are coming to support their husband. She is by herself and there's no one there who can stand up to her and say, I believe her. Okay. So we see serious stuff in our communities. And we seem to think as Africans that our cultures are sacrosanct. They can't change. You know? Yet we select things we want to change about. But when it becomes things that disempower and oppress people, we want to keep those systems because they're culture and religion. 
I can go on and on and on, and I tend to get really pissed off when I start talking about those things. So let me just say that it's an honor to share my experiences with you guys. We need the help in the South Bronx. We need the help in Brooklyn because we really have many of our women who are in terrible, terrible situations. Ten years ago, I never saw an African woman who was homeless. Now I see African women who are homeless with their kids. So let's do something about it. Thank you. Thank you.